Back in May, I made a $3,400, 18-foot-long, 4,250-pound mistake. It looks like this. I thought that buying a 70-year-old car and getting it running again was gonna be easy. After all, that's what YouTube channels, like this very one I'm on, said it would be. It's really not that hard. But seven months later, the car still doesn't run, and I'm feeling discouraged and in over my head. So where did I go wrong? Well, here's a hint. When you buy a project car, you're not really buying a car. So how can you avoid my fate? Well, I'm gonna reveal my secret project car shame and tell you I'm gonna get this one back on track. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring today's video. Uh, 2000! Uh, I agree, Dave, very impressive. You know, ever since my accident, I've been doing physical therapy with this Jazzy Jerry guy. And if I'm being honest, this guy's got what I call the three L's. He's got looks, he's got legs, and most important, he's got locks. And I'm not talking about smoky sound, man. I'm talking about thick, luscious follicles. The kind I used to have until I became one of the two out of three guys to experience male pattern baldness by the time I was 35. Look at me. I'm 42 and I'm falling apart here. What the f I wish I had keeps when I was your age. They got these fancy doctors who consult you and your hair loss right over the online interweb stanky. And then they ship you your hair loss medication right to your front door every three months. That must be nice. That's less time it's taking to get a new up to speed. Get with it, James. I'm trying to get some up to speed in my life. Now, when you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash wheelhouse50 or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Okay, now let's sit back, relax, and enjoy my nephew's little show. You know, he's famous. He's got his own t-shirt. Maybe Uncle Jerry can get his own t-shirt. Who knows? Just to be clear, the 1952 Chrysler Imperial I bought some months back is not my first project car, and frankly, I should have known better. Way back in 2008, before I even had my driver's license, my dad called me over to look at a car he found on Craigslist, and I knew I had to have it at first sight. The gaping maw and quad headlights were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Right then and there, I said, Hell yeah, dad, that's the one, I want it. A few days and $1,500 later, my entire net worth at the time, I was the latest owner of a 1962 Dodge Dart four-door. I guess I have a soft spot for Mopar sedans. We parked the car in my parents' side yard and I started wrenching on it. So why am I not dailying that thing today? Well, I made a very poorly timed decision. After we brought the car home, my dad and I started talking about what we should do with it, right? The Dart was pretty dang straight. Rust was basically limited to the passenger floorboard, which could easily be replaced. It also had the Chrysler 225 Slant 6 in it, which is legendarily bulletproof. So the decision was, do we repair the rust and get the car driving as is, or do we go a little crazy? Um, we went crazy or at least plan to. We bought a 440 big block that once powered an RV. I got a front disc brake conversion kit for safety and we stripped the interior and paint. My dad even built a rotisserie from scratch so we can more easily work underneath the car. Things were going great. I was gonna have the coolest car in my high school parking lot, no doubt. But then the economy tanked. And that kind of put a stop to the build because there's no money to keep going. In the meantime, my grandpa gave me his old Taurus. I drove that through high school. I graduated high school, then went to college, came home from college, uh, went back to college, started interning at Donut, finally finished college, then started working at Donut. And that whole time, my dart sat right here. Doesn't look that much different, does it? It probably would have if we had just decided to fix that frickin' rusty floorboard instead. You know, I remember as a kid reading Hot Rod magazine, and people would say that, you know, a car took them eight years to build, and I just couldn't understand why. How does it take you eight years to put some bolts on a car and paint it, you know? But I was a kid. I just didn't understand. It's not the labor itself that takes a lot of work, but rather the life that happens in between that does. Dart, I will come back for you. 
This is my 1952 Chrysler Imperial, and believe it or not, it was actually one of the most sophisticated cars in America at the time of its debut, second only to Cadillac. Now, the Imperial name was known for being super cush, and as such, this car has some very cool features like power windows, it has an automatic transmission, it has power steering, and a very cush interior. Uh, don't mind the junk. Chrysler even made a longer version with room for eight in a sedan, which is pretty crazy. The Imperial was a pretty baller car, and I bought this one for two main reasons. Uh, one, I love the patina, and two, the 331 Hemi under the hood. This was a pretty important feature for me. Back when Up to Speed was on, I wrote a bunch of episodes, including the Hemi episode, and I vowed that I would someday own a 331 car. And here we are. I got what I wanted, but I also got a lot more than I bargained for. Most of my problems so far have stemmed from what I think is the biggest speed bump in project car ownership, and that's overestimating your own abilities. Now, to give myself some credit on my own show, by the way, I started out pretty strong. I refreshed the ancient drum brake system with some new wheel cylinders, springs, and shoes, so now it can stop, just like my progress did right after that. The main issue right now is I can't really tell what else needs fixing if the engine doesn't run. I've completely stalled thanks to myself thinking I knew how to do stuff that I don't. It was entirely my fault. Lots of people will tell you that old carbureted engines are easier to work on than modern fuel injected ones. That's pretty much a staple piece of online car advice when someone is asking if they should buy an old car. And it's true, older engines have less components and kind of go together like Legos. But what usually isn't said is that putting something together is way different than diagnosing a problem. <laughs> Foolishly, I figured, hey, I'm a car YouTuber. These issues will magically reveal themselves to me and I'll have a running car by Christmas. I was wrong. Uh, it takes a lot of real hands-on experience to diagnose many significant issues, especially ones with carburetors. And that's experience that I just don't have. These pieces of antique engineering don't care how many articles you've read or videos you've watched, if you haven't put in the work, they're not gonna wanna work either. I purposely haven't made any content with the Chrysler, okay? I didn't wanna have to buy a project car as a hobby, then turn it into my job by having to make videos about it, because that kind of defeats the purpose of buying something for fun, in my opinion. The car itself is in very good condition. There's very little rust, the body is straight, and the interior had to have been redone at some point. That was actually one of the main selling points for me, is I didn't want to have to redo an interior by myself, okay? I definitely don't know how to do that. The Imperial also came with a bunch of new and old parts. It was a complete project car package, ready to park it in your buddy's side yard because you don't have room at your apartment, which I immediately did after purchasing it. Thank you, James. At least that part was easy. So with my reality of project cars in mind, what can you learn from my experience to put yourself in the best position for success? What are the little things that probably aren't on your mind when you see that busted Chevelle for a nice price or that Eclipse GSX in your neighbor's yard? I think the most important thing to consider is your budget. If you can only afford to buy a project but not get it running or keep up on maintenance, just move on. A car that you can drive and enjoy is gonna make you way happier than a car just sitting ever will. This also applies to daily drivers. Uh, keep in mind that nothing is more expensive than a cheap luxury car. The maintenance is gonna kill you. You also gotta keep in mind availability. What if you found a super rare car for cheap that only had a few issues? It might be a big pain if you don't know what you're doing, okay? It was only after I bought the Imperial that I started to think, eh, where am I gonna get parts for this thing? <laughs> the Imperial is not a popular car, and I actually did have a hard time finding parts until I learned that my car is basically a dressed up Chrysler New Yorker, of which there are many OEM parts available. But if there weren't, I would've been pretty screwed. Keep in mind that a less common car may be more expensive to restore because replacement parts are less plentiful and it might not have a robust aftermarket as well. I think another important thing to consider is whether or not the car suits your actual desires in the first place. A few weeks after buying the Chrysler, GM happened to lend us a C8 Corvette, which was awesome. I took the vet out to Angeles Crest and realized, 
oh no, I want a car that I want to take here every weekend. And the Chrysler isn't, shall we say, suited for the twisties. If I really wanted to, I bet it would be possible to outfit it with some sort of modern suspension system, but I neither have the money nor the skill to facilitate that. If you're on a budget, it's a much better option to buy a car that is already designed to do what you want to do rather than spend a bunch of money modifying a car that's not meant for your chosen discipline and most likely performing worse than a dedicated car would anyway. Of course, this doesn't really apply if you have a ton of cash because you can usually throw money at a problem until it's solved. I also highly, highly recommend that you don't buy someone else's project if you have little experience. You don't know where they left off or if they did a good job in the first place. And if you're not careful, their rust bucket will become your rust bucket. Take it from me. But besides budget, I think the most valuable piece of advice I can give you, one thing I hope you remember is to be honest with yourself about your ability. How much do you really know how to do? I will concede that a lot of mods are super beginner friendly, okay? Things like wheels, suspension, even seats and steering wheels can be done by novices. It's really not that hard. There's a lot of guides online how to do that, including our own show, Money Pit. And I actually encourage you to do these things because one, you're making a car your own and that's awesome. And two, you're learning how your car is put together, which will help you diagnose problems down the road because you can more easily visualize the cause. But things like bodywork and serious engine issues do take a lot more experience. You're probably gonna need help with those if you wanna do it right, take it from me as well. Now that I've imparted some hopefully helpful advice, there's still something bugging me, okay? I have the feeling my project car problem isn't completely my fault. It's actually Zach Job's fault and Amelia Hartford's fault and Dave Freiberger's fault, sort of. In the age of YouTube and social media, the project car as a concept has become romanticized to a degree. For the most part, when you see a build on Instagram or YouTube, you don't see a majority of the work that went into it. It's simply not possible to condense days, weeks, or months of work into a 20 minute video. And hell, Donut is guilty of this too. With Hilo, we shot over four weeks of footage to make 16 episodes. At least we showed how much we struggled. Uh, Turbo Week alone aged me three years. Our car might be broken still. No! What failure looks like. The longest week of either of our lives. And to Money Pit's credit, that might be one of the more realistic project car series out there because in real life, shit happens and it makes it into the episode. I debated this for like 10 minutes and then I just went based on what the picture looked like. But even when we do screw up and show you, the problem still gets resolved by the end of the episode and everything is okay. All right, so that does it. That's a whole cooling system. I don't think I'm wrong when I say that this might set some unrealistic expectations for the average side yard mechanic like myself. I think I fell victim to this romanticization. The Chrysler is only the second project car I've ever taken on myself. I don't really count low car because we worked on it as a team. It's a team effort. But I forgot that this time around, I would basically be by myself. I imagined the finished product without fully considering what it would take to get there. As a community, I think we gotta break free of this romanticization beamed to us through our screens and be honest with ourselves. We can't deny the truth that project cars are always gonna be a challenge. I mean, it's in the name, Project Car. If you're thinking about picking up a project car, which I still recommend, keep this advice in mind, okay? When you buy an old car like this, you're not buying an object. What you're doing is you're signing up for an experience, okay? It's like a lot of different monetary commitments in life, like a gym membership or school courses. These things have the potential to make you happy or make you feel fulfilled or even make you a better person, but part of that transaction is that you gotta hold up your end of the deal and put in the effort as well. Despite all my whining, I still really, really love my Chrysler and I really, really want to drive it. It's plush. It's got that Hemi V8 and it's just unique. It's not gonna be LS swapped or wide bodied or caged or vinyl wrapped, anything like that. It's gonna be mine. I just wanna get it running so people can see a 70 year old car on the road. And I also wanna apply that experience of driving it to future videos. After that, maybe I'll lower it, fix these rust spots, get some cool wheels and be the king of patina Instagram. Who knows, I don't know. But I can't do that until I'm honest with myself and realize for that to happen, I gotta put in the work. Pop, 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 pop,
and down headlights. Shirt! They're finally here! It took forever to design these things, but the results are amazing! This is truly my favorite shirt that we have ever put out. That's what happens when you keep getting better at it! We got two different colorways! They're both black, but they got different colored inks on them! I'm talking yellow and white, or green and red, and both of them are fire! You better order both of them now, because they're not going to last very long at all. I'm ordering 12 of them myself. We're printing them right now, so go get them while you still can. Donutmedia.com. Tell them James sent you. There's actually no way that you can do that, but maybe tell yourself under your breath when you hit the cart. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to my weird project car diatribe, uh, kind of a different video this week, but you know what? It had to be said. If you'd like to see more videos, uh, hit that subscribe button, please. Uh, like this video if you did. It surprisingly actually really does help us out. If you're looking at a project car, check out this episode of Money Pit, which is the complete buyer's guide on how to get a good one. Um, very, very helpful video. I should probably watch that again, actually. Check out this episode of Up to Speed on the Hemi, the episode that uh, started it all. Uh, <laughs> Be kind. See you next time.